So today's topic is crime deviance in the street, and the, um, the lecture today will have material. Um, it, it, it relates to a lot of the material that we've looked at in, in the course already. So we've looked at the notion of moral panic. Um, you'll see that in both mine and Alistair's work that Bourdieu is quite a big deal, and we'll be uh, drawing upon ideas of that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you know we'll, today we'll be just be able to talk and mention some of those theories um, in passing, and we won't have to explain those too much. And you can. Um, uh, hear about some of the, the way that they're used um, in actual everyday research. Um, so today's lecture, a brief intro to youth crime and deviance, uh, a, a brief intro to um, urban precarity, the global city and, and ghettos and, and what that means for the lives of young people. Then Alice is going to talk about some of his recent uh, research with gangs in, in some of those cities around the world and uh, you will briefly touch upon the rights at the end. So there's a photo of me and Alistair in Hong Kong when I visited him earlier in the year. It's a beauty. So, um, yeah, that's uh, what Alistair looks like there. With, an, uh, with a building coming out of my head. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, that was uh, after a, uh, both had a bit of a hangover, I think, too. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we, the first thing I want to kind of talk about is the very uh, introductory ideas about crime and deviance. Um, deviance itself being a really important sociological uh, object of study. Uh, sociologists tend to look at the notion of deviance in, in a uh, very non-judgmental way. Uh, we think about it um, not trying to as much about improving people's lives or morals and values too much. We think about the very notion of deviance and how it's kind of constructed and socially constructed, which is something that I've talked about throughout the course. So, you know, we can think about this very broadly. Deviance is relative to time and place. And secondly, um, deviance lies in the eye of the beholder. So you can think about, you know, deviance lies in the relevant time and place. You know, Elvis in the 50s was banned from being on television because he was shaking his hips. It was seen as too deviant to be on TV. And today, you know, you have, you know, much more, more overtly sexual stuff going on TV. It's not as deviant today. So in terms of lies in the eyes of the beholder, um, you know, if you, if you think about the idea of antisocial behaviour, where it can seem, you know, a group of young people walking down the street can be seen as being a form of deviance, even if they're not really doing anything. So the, the, the idea itself um, is something that we critically engage with. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the notion of deviance, I guess, uh, I, when it was first introduced, a new sociology of deviance really turned the study of crime on its head. So rather than looking at the factors uh, that caused crime amongst young people in particular, the new deviancy theorists started to look at how the operation of the state and other institutions kind of criminalise young people in certain ways. Uh, so Howard Becker, for example, talks about uh, the primary fact about deviance being that it's created by society. So that, as I say, it, it flips the idea of deviance on its head. So rather than looking at young people as the problem, it looks at the uh, those that have the power and authority to criminalise young people as the as the focus mm. of attention. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and one of the key, uh, I suppose, ways that it happens is through the media. So again, in week two, from memory, we I um, spoke about the idea of moral panic, and much of the moral panics about young people are around deviance and around crime. There seems to be a constant idea that there's some kind of crime wave, but um, crime wave happening. Yet, you know, many of the statistics, particularly relating to young people, seem to indicate that. Um, you know, crime is stagnant and if not going down in many of those key categories. So, you know, what's going on here and, um, you know, as a lot of the stuff in that slide unpacks there, um, uh, a lot of the kind of sensational media stuff is around young people and crime and it play, plays, as I said, in the week two stuff, a particular political role of scapegoating, of being a kind of smokescreen for real social problems. But I mentioned statistics there and uh, uh, both Alistair and I are more qualitative sociologists um, and um, we, I don't know, in, in sociology in general we tend to be a little bit suspicious of crime statistics and what they measure. Um, really crime statistics pretty much only measure who was busted. Um, it doesn't really measure how much crime's going on. I'd say many of the people listening to this right now probably committed a crime last week in some way or another, but if you don't get busted it doesn't appear um, on the figures. But it's not even that, that simple. Um, crime statistics often just kind of reflect as well 
a particular thing that police are interested in at the moment. Um, so I've mentioned in the past that, uh, you know, the stuff around the nightlife, uh, moral panics in Newcastle, there was a kind of uh, spike in crime statistics around assaults at some of the venues. Well, at the time, the police were actually sitting out the front and being really strict about that kind of stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean there was more assaults that weekend. It just means the police saw more of them. So when it comes to young people in this kind of stuff, uh, youth sociologists in particular are more interested really in the way that young people are mostly the victims of crime in terms of the statistics. They are a higher percentage in that kind of realm. Um, but as I said, yeah, in terms of the statistics themselves, we need to be kind of a little bit suspicious about that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into too much detail in the other slides. In, in, in a way, I've just put them there to, as a reminder to hark back to um, the, uh, the earlier material in the course about the media and moral panics, and particularly Mark Davis's book, Gangland, that I talked about then. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, relating this to today's lecture, you're probably well familiar with many of the moral panics about young people and gangs. And again, the, the research around this suggests that much of the stuff in the media that's spoken about as gangs aren't really gangs. But um, certainly the stuff that Alice is going to talk about today um, are. So I've just got some more information there for you to look at your own leisure. A little bit about the notion of demonising youth. A little bit of stuff about crime stats. Again, I think I've mentioned before that there was stuff in Queensland that had that, you know, if more than three young people were hanging out together, they were moved on, and it kind of meant that if you're having a game of doubles tennis, you could have been actually uh, um, charged with loitering. Um, there's all kinds of really um, kind of weird and overtly strict uh, uh, policies around young people, um, you know, that I've uh, spoken about a little bit in terms of the nanny state. Um, in, in general, and I might get Alistair to talk a little bit more about this, um, there's... As you can imagine, like all things in sociology, there's lots of theories about uh, crime and deviance. Um, there's pretty, and, and they, they all kind of have their own political, um, I suppose, flavour. So there's the voluntaristic theories that kind of argue that people that make choices, they just make bad choices, they don't, you know, they think as humans as rational decision makers. Um, there's the social, social integration theories that um, mention the way that various uh, uh, societies and the way that they work can actually affect um, forms of deviance and Durkheim's classic study about um, suicide is a really good example of that. Um, in the more sociological theories though start thinking about situational factors, peer groups, structures, cultural factors and all that kind of stuff and the Chicago School in particular has been a really important um, group of uh, criminologists that have been influential about the way that youth studies practitioners generally think about crime and deviance. The, the Chicago School um, behaviour considered deviant, uh, uh, considered deviant behaviour uh, about notions of conformity as much as kind of deviance I suppose, about how people in particular, uh, what they called subcultures in a, in a different way than um, the Birmingham School, uh, were more likely to pursue what the mainstream were called deviant activities but they wouldn't really consider it deviant. Yeah, well, the Chicago School was, um, I guess, the foundation for a lot of what we now think of as theories of youth, crime, and urban space. Uh, it was a kind of, uh, to put it in a little bit of historical context, uh, Chicago at the time was a rapidly urbanizing, rapidly industrializing city uh, with immigrants moving from Europe and from the south of the United States. Um, and the University of Chicago was set up as a uh, deliberately world-leading university by massive donations from John Rockefeller and the, uh, the university president was, uh, basically gave uh, carte blanche to go and hire the best of the best academics from all over the United States and bring them together to form new departments. So he brought uh, the kind of the cream of the crop of new sociologists into Chicago into this rapidly industrialising environment uh, and that came to be known as the Chicago School of Sociology the, it was led by an ex-journalist called Robert Park, uh, who famously instructed his graduate students to go out and get the seat of your pants dirty in real research. Mm -hmm. So using journalistic methods to understand the kind of everyday lives and rhythms of this rapidly industrializing city, treating the city as a sort of social laboratory or petri dish yeah. for what they uh, presume to be generic urban uh, 
and social processes. What do you mean by journalistic efforts? Journalistic in the sense of going out and speaking to people. Yeah, they wouldn't have called it ethnography at the time, but that's yeah. certainly what we would call it now, yeah. uh, by going out and spending time in the streets. So, I mean, I'll come and talk about this later, but Frederick Thrasher's The Gang is a great example of it, where he spent eight years going around youth projects, speaking to uh, people in the streets and kind of getting a street sense of... Um, of what gangs meant to people, yeah, yeah, and can, kind of composing a picture of that yeah. uh, overall. Um, the more contemporary version of that would have been the book that became really popular, Gang Leader, for a day. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's using the same sorts of uh, methodologies that Thrasher did, yeah, yeah. Uh, with a kind of deep level embedded of embeddedness within yeah. a community in Chicago also. And so there's, there's this long history of... Uh, of embedded research yeah. that emerged from the Chicago School, yeah. uh, but it was also criticised because it uh, looked only at a kind of it, at the city as a kind of generic social form and not at the structural and spatial and design-related factors that kind of yeah. pattern the city. So how and why certain groups become shunted and shoved and pushed and pulled around the city into different spaces, yeah. Um, and yet yeah, some of those processes that Wacom talks about more yeah. recently. There was also some controversies, there, well, there is ongoing controversies around some of this research in terms of the ethical behaviour too, isn't there? Well, I, mean, I guess that's a whole other debate about yeah. ethics. Uh, the um, university ethics has, is a relatively modern uh, invention, mm. but uh, the, um, uh, the yeah, I'm not actually sure what, what debates you're referring uh, well, to. Well, uh, recently there's been Goffman's uh, work in um, in the United States, I'm not sure what city, where uh, she was accused of, in inverted commas, going native and actually get, starting to get involved in some of the criminal activity where um, she was actually accused of driving a getaway car and stuff. Now, the argument here is that, you know, from a researcher's point of view, you're not meant to be kind of lubricating crime. Yeah. From the researcher's point of view, it's like, well, you know, if I don't actually live it, I'll be rejected and I'll be out and actually might make it more dangerous for me. So the ethical considerations in terms oh, of research, but there's yeah. also ethical considerations from the researcher's point of view to protect their research participants. Yeah, oh, sorry, I mean, I thought you were referring to the Chicago School itself. Right? Yeah, sorry, but, just um, talking about generally about but it. The, yeah. But, yeah, within ethnographic practice, I mean, this, this is one of the big debates, yeah. and Alice Goffman's On the Run is a really yeah. good recent example yeah. of it. It was researched in Philadelphia at yeah. the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. As a graduate student, she uh, worked with a group of guys that were on the run from yep. the, uh, uh, and the police. And it was like a very um, uh, well-regarded ethnographic um, study, uh, mm. and rightly so in my view, yep. uh, as a way of kind of documenting the everyday entanglements that the war on crime and the mm. war on drugs has had on uh, young people's lives. Yep. Uh, but yeah, there's there's that whole debate about going native and the morality and ethics of it. But yeah, yeah maybe that's yeah, maybe, maybe that's, that's, uh, that is another lecture, yeah. for another lecture. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, and the last two uh, slides in this kind of section, just to introduce the uh, uh, foundational ideas of what we're uh, basing today's lecture on. And you mentioned Howard Becker already, who's probably one of the most famous sociologists of all time, um, and very very prominent. Uh, Becker's Becker kind of inverts the common sense idea of deviance, I suppose, um, and argues that, yeah, as Alice has said, deviance is created by people who make the rules and who then label anyone who breaks a rule as deviant. And um, I suppose you can hear echoes, and, and, and Becker kind of actually critically engages with Bourdieu in some of his more recent work. But again, here you can, I, you know, from the material we've used in the course already, you can understand that from a Bourdieuian perspective as well in terms of the struggles that I've been talking about earlier in the course. Um, so again, that, that, that quote there, um, the deviant is one who, whom the label has successfully been applied. So again, there's kind of struggles in these fields over what is deviant and what's not, and what is criminal and what's not. And remember here too that deviance doesn't necessarily have to be illegal. Um, we call, you know, there's been all, the notion of deviant has been used in, in various ways that doesn't necessarily pertain to illegal behaviour. So the, I've left uh, some quite detailed information in this slide about Becker and that one as well, about the various um, levels of deviance and all that kind of stuff, but we don't really have time to go into that in too much detail today. The second part of the uh, lecture I want to talk about uh, with Alistair is the idea of youth and precarity. So I'll, um, I'll ask you to... Yeah, sure. I mean, like from, from what Steve says, I understand that the majority of the classes so far have been looking at Australian uh, field sites. Mostly, yeah. Uh, with a little bit of kind of other stuff thrown in, but... Um, 
been concentrating on Australian um, yeah, sure. samples as much as possible. Um, what this section is about is, I guess, trying to extend out from some of those same processes that you've been discussing in Australia to look at other uh, global sites um, and the way in which comparable social, cultural, economic and political processes are impacting on young people in more or less similar ways uh, in different, mostly urban areas around the world. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly here about um, the theme of youth and urban precarity and the rise of what is known as the global city. This idea is um, about the way in which globalization has reoriented the way that uh, economics works, but also the way that urban spaces develop. So the idea is that rather than uh, one uh, country or one group of country having overall economic control over the rest of the world, rather power and uh, money are concentrated in a small number of global sites, global cities, and they're New York and Tokyo and um, Hong Kong and London and Paris, these kind of global uh, centres that uh, represent a kind of uh, concentration of headquarters for major global corporations and also have a, a huge kind of secondary economy set, set up around servicing those headquarters. Uh, so the, so the, this is a kind of concentration of wealth within certain key urban context. One impact of that is that there has been winners and losers in the hierarchy of global cities. So as we have shifted from industrialism to post-industrialism, Fordism to post-Fordism, and uh, so the bases for um, work and um, consumption within national context has reconfigured. And so yeah, some cities have won out, like your Londons, your uh, Hong Kongs, have become very uh, well developed as a result. Other cities, I think Glasgow is one example, um, have lost out. They have uh, they've been unable to kind of regenerate in a way that attaches into this new kind of uh, global logic uh, of the city. So that's just a little bit of context of how uh, the uh, global city debate is developed. The other side of that though is that as well as there being winners and losers within the hierarchy of global cities, there are also winners and losers within the global city. Uh, so um, uh, some, for some people, they're able to participate in the global economic um, uh, development. For many other people, they're left behind. They're kind of detached or rendered immobile by these changes. Uh, that, that is much more narrowly to do with the way that uh, space and spatial patterning is economically um, structured within the global city. And so you can hear that this links quite strongly to the um, earlier stuff that I was talking about in the course about precarious unemployment and about the, the prolonging of transitions for young people. Precisely. Yeah. So, the, um, so the work here of Guy Standing and Louis Quacon I think is most um, prominent and most helpful in terms of unpicking some of these similarities and differences. Uh, one thing that I'm, uh, I guess like speaking of similarity and difference, that is one thing that I'm really interested in. Uh, so what is it that uh, is kind of comparable uh, for young people in different urban contexts around the world? So I think that um, one important thing in the global city debate is the kind of de-emphasis of the national as a, as a level of analysis and the um, reincorporation of the city as a key site through which to understand the articulation of these global processes. So uh, Guy Standing is one person that has uh, done a lot to try and reconfigure the way that we think about social class in particular uh, in a non-national basis. So he's tried to be thinking globally and transnationally about these processes of economic precarity and how they're impacting people in more or less comparable ways. So he contrasts the kind of traditional class-based model of upper, middle and working class uh, that's very much based in a national context and a kind of relatively static notion of what the state actually is with uh, what he calls the new stratification. Uh, which is much more global in orientation. And you can see on the slides here uh, the w some of the ways in which he, uh, he categorizes these different groups. I mean, for our current concerns, the most um, important group, though, is what he calls the precariat, which is a portmanteau words of the precarious proletariat. 
basically arguing that neoliberal policies around the world have created a similar level of instability uh, of job, of housing, uh, of uh, prospects of insurance, um, creating a, a sense of anger, anomie, anxiety and alienation amongst young people in a global context. Exploitation. Yeah, yeah that there's a, a kind of a subjective experience or a kind of emotional experience of anxiety, of uncertainty, of alienation that, uh, that has been a direct result of these global shifts. Mm. Um, and I mean, I think this is a good way of thinking about some of the large global changes that have happened, that have been youth-led uh, in recent years. And these run from political shifts, like those um, uh, led by the indignados in Spain, uh, the, uh, the kind of Occupy politics uh, in Wall Street and uh, in Hong Kong and London and elsewhere. Um, uh, they also represent the, uh, as also a way of thinking about sort of youth subculture and lifestyle changes, such as those of the freeters in Tokyo, uh, which mm -hmm. um, is a, a fine example of a breakdown of a very structured uh, work school to work transition amongst young people kind of breaking down and uh, and a kind of a, a, an experience of precarity being uh, played out in youth cu culture. So yeah, can you say a little bit more about the freighters and what they are? And, yeah. yeah, so the, the freighters are, I mean, very traditionally in Japan there was the so-called salary man, so there was very large state-owned uh, enterprises that would be looked, that would fulfill some of the functions of a family actually, so they'd uh, they put up people's mm, families, yeah. they could provide accommodation, provide life insurance, they would be kind of a job for life and it would be a very structured kind of hierarchical system that you were, uh, that you were drawn into after leaving school. But as a result of these global changes and neoliberal policies, those those kind the of hierarchical crash. structures uh, absolutely yeah, crash, yeah. um, have started to break down and that clear link between the school and a structured work has broken down. Uh, so for that particular group of uh, young people there's no longer a clear school to work transition and no longer that stability uh, but for some people that has turned into a kind of lifestyle choice so it, it has created a sort of subcultural response that is um, I found that, that, is, that, that uses that uncertainty and kind of turns it into uh, something creative uh, so people deliberately use that as a as a lifestyle choice for better or worse so see this so these are some of the i guess uh, political or subcultural impacts of the yeah. new stratification but the other side of that uh, are what can sorry. i just say too that um, yeah. so many of the things that um alice is pointing out here that uh that standing points out they resonate strongly a lot with the, the uh, social changes that uh, ulrich beck talks about so uh, notions of reflexivity and individualization detraditionalization um i suppose uh, beck, beck talks about it in those terms uh where standing kind of actually points more at the economic yeah. problems. So Beck, Beck's incorporating all kinds of other discourses, whereas Standing himself, his work, I suppose, is more traditionally Marxist yeah. um, and is uh, much more focused on the way that these economic changes affect school-to-work transitions. Of, in, Standing's not a youth sociologist per se, but in a way his work is quite, a, quite useful for thinking about that specifically. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah, it just cause yeah. he talks about the precariat, precariat yeah. explicitly as a class in itself, but not yet a class yeah, for itself. itself. And that's yeah. kind of what he's aiming at in his most recent book, The Precariat Charter. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the other person that's interesting to me here is uh, the work of Luc Wacont. Uh, so uh, Wacont is the kind of uh, uh, Bourdieu's most famous protege, I, was, I would say. Uh, yeah. he, he was uh, Bourdieu's PhD student and became uh, you know, one of the most prominent sociologists in the world himself, wrote a couple of books with Bourdieu and since then has made a, a huge name for himself as a kind of urban sociologist writing about changes in global cities. Uh, a book we're not going to talk about here, unfortunately, is his amazing autoethnography when he trained in a, uh, a African-American boxing gym and he wrote this uh, great book called Body and Soul where he uh, trained in this gym for years and years with these guys and ended up having an amateur fight. Um, and in that book, uh, Waquant talks about habitus from a body perspective, um, but he's, I suppose, more well known or for his urban urban work, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, he is. Uh, I mean, he's ha probably publishes prolifically and prodigiously yeah, across a massive range of different uh, disciplines. 
Yeah, uh, and he drinks a lot of coffee. Uh, um, but so, I mean, I mean, so as as Steve mentioned, I mean, his work is wide ranging and uh, um, always very um, uh, powerful in whichever um, discourse he's uh, engaging in. Uh, but in relation, so one of the, one of his more important uh, recent books is a book called Urban Outcasts. And although he doesn't explicitly deal with uh, standing or these issues of insecurity, his work speaks, I think, very directly to the flip yeah. sides of the, um, uh, the the shift to the global city. So, for, as I say, for some people, there has been forms of political resistance, subcultural resistance. Uh, what on looks at those that are really left behind and immobilized by uh, processes connected to the global city. So it is a comparative ethnography between Chicago and Paris, um, looking at the similarities in the formation of um, uh, socio, socio-spatial marginalization in both cities uh, and the similarities in the kinds of dispositions and what he calls territorial stigma of these areas in the city that are kind of perceived as uh, leprous badlands. These areas of the city that become kind of uh, stigmatized and stereotyped and people fear to enter. And he talks about some of the ways in which uh, similar global processes are fed into that. Crucially though, he, he doesn't talk about this in a homogenous way. He looks at the very different matrices of state formation, the class and ethnicity and gender uh, in the formation of American and French statehood. So he's not arguing that these are the same phenomena. He's, talk, he's saying that they're there are comparable structural processes, but they're articulated through a cultural uh, lens that has resulted in different kind of formations. So, for instance, the, in the United States, the uh, scale and depth of violence is on a, uh, a level that far eclipses that of Paris. Uh, what on describes it as comparing heavyweights with flyweights. Um, but so this... Um, I mean, the reason I wanted to bring this up is partly to emphasize that theme of similarity and difference in cities, but also to point to these particular parts of the city um, that are uh, that are marginalized. Mm -hmm. And for Wakon, it's, it's, they are also kind of prisonized. So there's a, a, what he yeah. calls a deadly symbiosis between the prison and the ghetto. He essentially argues that poverty becomes criminalized, doesn't he? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, he also says that the welfare state retrenches from these areas, and in particular in the United States, so that in this context, the, the welfare state steps back and the kind of penal state yeah. steps in. So yeah. it's both the left hand and the yeah. right hand of the state. And so one of the th developments he talks about is that as, um, as the welfare states disappear, um, the, the shift goes from work fair to prison fair. So yeah. the key um, association that people in poverty have with the state moves from welfare to crime and, and going to prison and hence the, the incredible numbers of African Americans in, Absolutely. in jail. Absolutely. It's like the, the figures are astounding. The, the, the vocabulary that he introduces around territorial stigma I think is also very resonant in a comparative context because I mean you think in many languages around the world there is a word to depict those areas in the, in the city. Uh, in the United States, it's the ghetto. In Brazil, it's the favela. In yeah. Beijing, it's the urban village. In Glasgow, it's the scheme. Yeah. Uh, in London, it's the estate. Like yeah. there's there is a, a kind of a vocabulary yeah. that attaches to these places, which yeah. indicates to me that they uh, that that Wakon has kind of mm. um, has conned on to yeah. or, or or given a, a a voice to a kind of a relatively. Uh, um, wide-ranging and widespread yep. set of social and spatial processes. Yep. 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 Um, so, I mean, th th these, I guess, this section has been by way of introducing these themes around global cities, precarity, and uh, space, and adaptive responses. So we've seen across these different global sites, different forms of youthful adaptation yep. to these similar global processes as they're articulated at a local level. Yep. And and Quant's very um, vehement about why this happens. He doesn't really. He do, when, when we're talking about global processes here, he's not saying as if it's some something out of human control and it's just economics. Yeah. Well, Quant points very um, straight at the kind of uh, neoliberal kind of notions and, and politicians and 
and saying that this is actually the result of deliberate policy. Yeah. Um, and, del and, and in effect, he's arguing that there's a kind of new segregation happening. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, so um, my colleague John Hagedorn in Chicago uh, talks very similarly about a uh, about kind of new Jim Crow, basically. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that um, in there, there was restrictive uh, restrictive covenants in Chicago, I think, until the 1950s, which yeah. prevented the sale of property from one racial group to another. Yeah. Uh, and Hagedorn's argument basically is when those were repealed, uh, the response of the uh, Chicago governors was to drive freeways between mm. sort of historically racially segregated areas of the city. So they would continue to be yep. segregated, but by the architecture of the city rather yep. than by law. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a really good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just there's an anecdote that I remember uh, um, in a book uh, from a book called The Global Trap. Um, and in talk, I'm talking about here in terms of the deliberate nature of this. In the 90s, there was a, a really large conference attended by many world leaders and huge uh, business leaders such as Ted Turner and others. Um, it was a conference over a few days to talk about processes of globalization. And um, one of the sessions was about what to do about increased poverty. Now, it wasn't the session wasn't about should we stop it. It was about what do we do about it? What do us rich people need to do? To ensure that it doesn't come back to bite us, and a, a very, uh, a, a very prominent U.S. Um, a former U.S. diplomat uh, put up the idea that maybe we should uh, introduce what he called "titty tainment," um, and "titty" here refers to nourishment, and "tainment" is an entertainment. It was kind of a new form of the Romans' bread and circuses, and he basically pointed out that the way the globalization works, it'll mean that it's probably only going to be 20% of the world population needed to keep production and consumption going is going to leave 80% of the world on the sidelines. And so to stop violent revolution happening, we should introduce this idea of, of titty-tainment to try and um, avoid that. And it was a, it was an overt you kind of... Make that up, kind, I know, yeah. It's like, a and, and, but, movie. But, but, yeah, that's right. But it was also on public record. Like It wasn't like some... You know, people in the back in a back room smoking cigars and like deciding what's going to happen. It was actually yeah. a public forum where they seriously discussed this in public. So... The, so this isn't just economics happening kind of outside of the whole, uh, outside of our control. This this isn't the invisible hand. Yeah. It's actually, you know, oligarchical politics. Um, and, you know, in terms of the struggles in the field of politics, it's definitely one side winning here. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, so just to summarise that, rise of global city, very important implications for young people. We didn't talk a lot about young people here, but I want you to think about those in terms of, you know, relating some of that stuff that Beck talks about and, to, and also in, in more the inequalities and how that affects um, the transitions of young people, increased precarity and security, and importantly here, anger. Um, and as uh, Alistair said, there's some been very prominent, um, overtly political reactions against some of these developments in global cities. Um, uh, there's been a growth in spatially dislocated housing, um, which concentrates disadvantage at levels now that are kind of um, again, um, almost never happened in history before, really. Um, and obviously, this kind of leads to all kinds of issues around youth transitions, but also youth cultures, lifestyles, and what we're going to talk about here, kind of subcultures and lifestyles that are deemed criminal and deviant. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll let uh, Alistair now introduce his own uh, research around uh, gangs in a couple of global cities. Sure, yeah, I mean, I mean, most of my research today is focused on the city of Glasgow in Scotland, but I've also done some work in Chicago and Hong Kong, so I guess I'll focus here on Glasgow, but try to make some um, linkages to other global sites that I've done work in. So can you just mention what's going on here? There's Bulger there. Yeah, the so in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the pictures here, you've got C. Wright Mills and Bourdieu, both looking at a rapidly kind of developing... Uh, global context. So C. Wright Mills is the author of The Sociological Imagination. Yeah, so C. C. Wright Mills um, was a kind of maverick sociologist in many ways who kind of fought against the dogma of sociology in his time and argued um, for a kind of grounded sociology, a sociological imagination that would enable us to connect up uh, our private troubles with public oh, issues. Yeah, so yeah. we're able to connect up our individual lives with the big news of what's happening in society at the time. So to kind of cultivate a sociological imagination that shuttles between history 
biography and culture. And so what one thing I'm arguing for in relation to gangs is the need for a global sociological imagination yeah. to connect up the individual with the structure, but as I'll argue, through the lens of the city. Uh, and yeah, so I'll, I'll talk more about Bourdieu. Yeah, uh, and in similar ways, Bourdieu uh, argued uh, that sociology is what he called it. It was, it was translated as a combat sport, but it actually in French it was meant to mean, mean martial art. Yeah. Sociology is a martial art. It's meant to be used for defending the defenceless and not for attack and that kind of stuff. And he had very similar thoughts about what, so, what role sociology yeah, should There's play. a documentary called that. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, you can watch it on YouTube, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the final image on the slide there is uh, oh. of, uh, um, of my new book <laughs> yeah. uh, called, or just get a plug in there, <laughs> yeah. uh, called Urban Legends. And it's really about that that I'm going to be talking about. Yeah. Uh, and there's an electronic copy of that book through our library you can now um, access. Okay. And a hard copy in the library. Great. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so the, I mean, the, all of this is connected um, to the, uh, the issue of gangs, I suppose. Uh, the issue of, I mean, gangs, I mean, but this is not a course on gangs per se, but suffice it to say, it's a very contested field, a very contested field of representation, signification, and definition. Uh, and it's a very uh, problematic issue to define as a very loaded and pejorative term. Uh, but so I, I'm using the term gang here, not unproblematically, but simply as a descriptor for a, a, a kind of group of street based territorial youth uh, that engage in some form of violence or territoriality. Uh, basically, because that's the way that young people in my uh, research referred to it. So this thing we call a gang has become an increasingly sensitive and sensitized global issue. Um, um, so you see this all over the world, the, the gang phenomenon becoming a fearful um, symbol of um, uh, social change and, uh, and potential uh, for violence. And in this context, I mean, uh, what, I, what, you, what we're seeing uh, more and more is the construction of a fearful image of a global gang, often rooted in American stereotypes of street gangs. Um, so it's an idea of the gang as something that's fixed, that's static, that's homogenous, that is composed of ethnic minority groups very often, that is something that you're either in or out of, uh, and if you're in, you're in for life, uh, that is kind of pathological, uh, that is damaging, that is kind of uh, a threat to the community. Um, and what we see is that uh, the, the, this image is spreading all over the world, but, uh, but researchers are, I think, um, failing to disaggregate uh, uh, this image and look at a local level at the, what the gangs actually mean to young people. So to just give a little bit of context here, I, I touched earlier on Frederick Thrasher's work in the Chicago school, and this is an important starting point. Thrasher basically argued that in, an, in a rapidly urbanizing, densely populated city environment, you would find large populations of youth hanging around on the streets, forming into natural playgroups and then instantly having to uh, defend their play privileges on the street against other groups and um, becoming, in Thrasher's great phrase, integrated through conflict. So in the conflict with other groups, they create a group consciousness and a name and a territory. And that's the kind of the formation of gang evolution that he set out. And I think that still holds pretty firm as a, as a kind of uh, as a basic, basic social process for how gang like groups form around the world. Now, the the thing about globalization is that it has, uh, it has accelerated and amplified those preconditions for gang formation. Uh, so Luke Dowdney uh, in a UNODC survey, uh, which looks qualitatively at gangs around the world, similarly identifies these factors uh, like distance from the state, poor provision of public service, high percentage of adolescents, and disproportionately high levels of unemployment as being kind of preconditions for gang formations in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one of the issues with gang research to date, I think, is a failure to attend to difference in diversity. Uh, so there has been efforts to universalize definitions of gangs. And I think that universal definition accords to American stereotypes and that fearful image of the global gang rather than the street-based realities of young people. So the quote from Sudhir Venkatesh, uh, I think, summarizes this well where he says, the similarities among and the connections across the Atlantic don't erase or make meaningless the distinctiveness of each locality. 
And this was very much my experience uh, between Glasgow and Chicago. I went to Chicago thinking that there were similarities in the urban development and the gang formations. There was kind of exchange between the two cities. Glasgow was called the Scottish Chicago. Uh, but when I went to Chicago, I found that those were completely blown out of yeah. the water. And the, the depth and scale and ferocity of violence in the communities was just uh, on, a different, uh, yeah. on a different level altogether. So basically what I'm arguing for and, and what I argue for in the book is a need for uh, uh, the grounding of understandings of gangs within the unique uh, political, social, cultural histories of certain world cities. Mm -hmm. So understanding the city as a lens through which uh, global economic and neoliberal decision makings and processes are refracted and articulated at a local level. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of grounding this fearful image of the global gang at a local level, but in a way that's still comparative. So I think looking at cities in the context of that global city hierarchy is a way to compare in a way that is, uh, is kind of sensitized to the global. Sure. Um, okay, so Glasgow is a city of about half a million in the, uh, um, the main central area and about 1.1 million in the metropolitan area. It's got a long history of territoriality and violent masculinities. Uh, first reported in the news in the 1880s during Glasgow's period of kind of high industrialism when it had the dubious honour of being second city of the British Empire through shipbuilding and uh, um, manufacture of trains and they were sent off to the four corners of the world. Uh, but um, in the 1930s and the Great Depression, it, Glasgow's industry fell away uh, and, one of the, and, that, and that has been one of the major shifts in Glasgow's history the rupture that's caused from industrial to post-industrial uh, uh, economic change. Yeah. So it's rebranded as a European city of culture, laterally it hosted the Commonwealth Games, it's attempted to regenerate and sandblast buildings yeah. and kind of create a new uh, shiny tourist friendly service economy. But for many people it, they've been left behind by that uh, and there's a kind of fundamental di disjuncture between the kind of street-based masculinities that I think yeah. are embedded and sedimented from the industrial era and the post-industrial yeah. realities of the economy for young people. And that's absolutely what I saw amongst the young people that I worked with, yeah. that kind of tension between the ways of being they learned on the streets and the needs of the economy that they were entering into. Yeah. So in Berdusian terms, it's a kind of conflict between habitus and field. Yeah. The habitus is persisted, but the field has changed. Yep. So there's notions of hysteresis going on there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you're right about Glasgow in the sense of, you know, when I visited there, you know, and I'm a middle class academic, there was lots of really interesting cultural stuff to do. But, you know, because the poverty is hidden, you know, it's not really in the centre of the city as much as, you know, the, the Glasgow outskirts. Yeah. And there's that incredible statistic that um, of the life, uh, the, the length of life of males in Glasgow between the richest percentile and the poorest percentile is 27 years difference. Yeah, it's terrifying. So, you know, uh, white males are dying in their early 50s yeah. on average in the poorest poverty in Glasgow when they're in the 80s, which is much more normal these days for those kind of things, In which is the biggest differentiation in Europe. It's actually more than Eastern Europe. So the, the level of poverty in Glasgow is just quite astounding. Well, yeah, so recent work that Danny Dorling has done has shown that 40% of people living in Glasgow are living below the poverty yeah. line, which is, I mean, it, it, it does, just doesn't bear comparison to most yeah. other cities. Yeah. Health researchers talk of the Glasgow effect, um, yeah. which is a kind of based on a kind of complex quantitative comparison between Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow, looking at very small comparison, comparisons between areas, areas that have similar social economic uh, and background factors, but finding that the health effects in Glasgow are much higher. Yeah. So people's health, morbidity and mortality rates are far worse than in comparable yeah. areas in Liverpool and Manchester, and they can't figure out why. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, just yeah. call it the Glasgow effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is the context, I guess, for my study. Like I, I uh, was a, I, um, it's a, I guess a four-year ethnography in a community I call Langview, a deindustrialized former working class community in Glasgow. There's latterly been a, a um, becoming a more gentrified community so it contains the seeds of old and new within it that I think allow you to speak of it as something of a microcosm of the city of Glasgow and the changes that have occurred there. 
So I worked as a youth worker there for several years as a street-based outreach worker uh, with young people in the streets on Friday and Saturdays as a high school tutor. Uh, and I lived in the community for a period of 18 months. Uh, so as I say, Langview is, uh, it, it's got both old and new. It is, it is within the 5% most deprived communities in Scotland and has a long-standing reputation for gangs, but it's also got some new apartments and people moving in uh, in the kind of standard gentrification form. Oh, so it is being gentrified. Yeah, right? absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, you see, um, so you see these changes, basically. Uh, in Glasgow, being articulated at a local level in Langview, so in the, this slide, I, uh, um, there was a survey done in Langview in the 1960s about young people's leisure opportunities. And I've documented on the slide what's happened in those spaces in the community since. So from being three cinemas in the 1960s, there's none now. The dance hall reopened as a bingo hall in a supermarket and is now modern flats. The school was turned into playing fields and then there was a car park for those same flats. The factories have been converted into artist spaces, call centres and modern flats. The cafes have closed down or reopened as these kind of global nowhere's fills or subways or Domino's pizzas. So you see the kind of commercialisation, the delocalisation of youth leisure, uh, narrowing the spaces available for young people to spend time in a public space. Uh, the the I mean, such that it was, there was work available for young people in Langview in the 1960s, but a small scale study I did with 18 to 25 year olds in the community demonstrated, like Rob McDonald's work in the north of England, that young people could expect a churn between low paid jobs, mm -hmm. unsubstantial government training schemes, uh, or insecure agency work, and unemployment. So that yep. was the kind of uh, work context. Yeah, yeah. So within this, uh, I guess, limited and limiting economic, social and spatial mobility around Glasgow, the streets became tremendously important to people. So I use the concept of street habitus to indicate uh, a deeply seated relationship between the spatial community, the territory of Langview and young people's sense of self, a pre-conscious connection between space and self. So they would say, instead of saying, I'm from Langview, like I'm from Langview, they would say, I'm Langview, as in, I am Langview, I am the space, the friendships, the mm -hmm. kinships, the uh, family that I have here. Yeah. So I mean, in, in, in the book, I, I focus really on this one group of young people that I call the Langview Boys, group of 12 to 16 year olds, that I got to know really well. They were very much the likely lads of Langview. They were always hanging about the streets. Their names were spray painted on the back door of my building when I lived there. Mm. I couldn't go down the street for a pint of milk without bumping into them. They were kind of just there. Yep. Uh, and um, they were the ones I felt really had the street habitus. They'd spent their childhoods all together within this small geographical area, um, um, kind of covering and recovering and re-recovering the same streets over and over again. Mm -hmm. And in that context, you look for any form of excitement. And this is familiar, I'm sure, to many people listening to this. When you're when you're a kid and you're bored, there's yeah. nothing like you get weird ideas. Phil Corrigan uses that great idea of doing nothing. Weird ideas like throwing eggs or smashing mm -hmm. milk bottles, just spontaneous yeah. sillinesses that emerge from being yeah. completely bored and devoid. But and that, that kind of develops from the notion from the Chicago School of Status Frustration, doesn't it? The idea that, you know, there's not much to do, I have low status. So it often coalesces as what, you know, normal people call violent behaviour, but it's actually a kind of expression of boredom and status. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's also, I mean, also comes straight out of the Birmingham School, yep. so it's an idea of, like, idea of resistance yep. through rituals, so yep. sort of yep. uh, minor forms of yep. uh, kind yep. of vandalism yep. and deviance as a representation of kind of structural exclusion. And that's, and that's exactly the way that I would, uh, that I would talk about uh, the Langview boys' behaviour. So they would, I don't know, like steal shopping trolleys and race them down the yep. hills. Uh, they would throw eggs at strangers. They would spray graffiti. But also they would get involved in violent conflicts with groups of young people from neighbouring areas. Um, so I guess the next thing to mention here is the idea of boundaries yep. and transgression. So as young people are kind of covering and re-recovering these same streets, they become aware from a very young age of a sense of boundedness. So what I call urban fault lines in the cityscape. And these are roads, canals and rivers, 
sort of ironically they were designed for greater mobility in and out of the city centre, but uh, yeah, they, but creating immobility because mm. they've become kind of uh, borders between Langview yeah. and the neighbouring areas of Hillside um, and Swigton. So as Robert says here, it's just an invisible boundary that everybody knows. Once you cross that boundary, you know you're in Lang Street, you know you're in Swigton, don't know how it came about. Um, and in the next slides, I, I, I asked James, how do you know where the boundaries are? It's bridges separating them all. And I don't know, because people made them so you could fight out of them, getting on, because there's a railway and a motorway, because there's motorways and all that. Yep. So here in, like, you know, again, reverting back to some subculture theory, the bridges are kind of almost a form of bricolage. They're reconstituted as boundaries. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I've yeah. not thought about it in those terms yeah. before, but that's exactly what they are. Yeah. Uh, there is def there's something sort of social psychological going on as well for me. So uh, it's uh, in the context of limited mobility, um, the creation of those boundaries creates kind of brackets the space or brackets a social field in which distinction can be gained. Yes. Uh, so it creates a social space or a social field within which there can be contest for um, supremacy or prestige uh, or, or distinction yeah, yeah. in Bourdieu's terms. Okay. Uh, so uh, in the next slides, uh, uh, Kev, after asking, why do you write LYT after your name? LYT being Langview Young Team, the name of the local gang, because that's where you're fae. Um, Michael says, you want to make a name for yourself. You don't want to be just anybody. You don't just want to be one of the faces in a crowd. It's all about rap reputation, all gang fighting. There's nothing in it except for reputation, just so some people will say he's crazy in that. So, I mean, one important point here is that, uh, I mean, conceptualising the gang not as something that you're either in or out of that's fixed or static in the way that the kind of fearful image of the global gang would suggest, but rather something that's performative, that's contingent, that's contextual, that's context-specific, something that waxes and wanes uh, during processes of social development, and something that's very much structurally and culturally located within uh, the post-industrial city. Yeah. Um, okay, um, there's a, a few more slides here with some uh, other quotations from the Langview boys, but I'm conscious of time here, so I'll maybe um, start to uh, draw out a little bit to the notion uh, of homologies of habitus. So this is the idea that, um, as I, I mean, I've tried to elaborate briefly the way in which uh, the Langview boys' everyday lives are um, structurally located, and the, their street-based dispositions are a kind of deeply embedded response to, or in kind of dialectic relation with, um, their structural, economic, and spatial positionality. Uh, so those habits and traits being representative in some way of the kind of hinterland of class, gender, mm -hmm. ethnicity, and so on. So this, I think, is a more productive way to think about comparison uh, than universal definitions, yeah. to think of something that's structured uh, and comparable across different contexts. So the work on here quote uh, mm -hmm. uh, speaks to that. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for, um, um, where I'm going now with research, I guess, is trying to uh, conceptualise uh, street crime, street culture, youth gang behaviour in a global and comparative context, using the vocabulary of Bourdieu to, uh, uh, to elaborate that. So as Jock Young says here in the Explosive Society, young men facing such a denial of recognition turn everywhere in the world to, to the creation of cultures of machismo, to the mobilization of one of their only resources, physical, sprint, uh, uh, physical strength. Uh, and, and we have seen these similar sorts of street-based cultures emerge in a range of different global contexts. So Philip Bourgoy's work in uh, New York, Eli Anderson in Philadelphia, Svenning Sandberg in Oslo, Johnny Lamb in Dublin, yep. they all use, are, are using these same sorts of vocabularies to talk about the code of the streets, mm -hmm. uh, the way in which um, the similar sort of economic global urban processes are creating these uh, kind of violent street cultures. So just to, just to kind of specify here, the notion of homology here is meant to mean that they're similar but not the same, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. they're similar. So that they are... Uh, similar things going on but they're kind of qualitatively different. Yeah, so they are emerging as a result of similar kind of similarly patterned uh, 
um, economic and social processes, but yes. they're but they're autonomous. So yes. like the same kind of emerging out of the same primordial soup, <laughs> but yeah. taking on very different ev evolutionary forms. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, you can go into um, these uh, at your leisure, but these are good examples from Philadelphia uh, to New York and to Oslo. All of these are studies in which um, yep. um, young people in particular are emerging in these um, communities. Okay. Uh, so, so I know you've looked at Bourdieu in the past, uh, and I think that there is a way of thinking about Bourdieu in a scalar way. Uh, so to think about uh, uh, nested fields uh, in which you can think locally or at a uh, city level or uh, internationally mm -hmm. about uh, about fields and that's one way to kind of conceptualize different levels of criminal activity between local or international or transnational contexts uh, but also a way to think uh, in a comparative sense uh, about um, gangs and street culture um, all right uh, so the uh, the, I guess the argument that I'm making here predominantly and the one that I'm making in the book is about gangs and uh, urban genealogy. So that's about rooting understandings of gangs and street culture within their particular urban context whilst looking for structural parallels with similar groups in similar urban areas yep. elsewhere. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, at the end there, kind of, uh, Alistair touched upon uh, in the scaling of Bourdieu that I, I think I mentioned in the introduction lecture to Bourdieu, and I think that's, a, again, a really useful way to think about uh, using Bourdieu, how can we use the different levels across different contexts. Um, uh, I think also that uh, I've been trying to emphasise the notion of struggle um, when I think about Bourdieu that I think is quite often overlooked, and, and again, I think the, the, the stuff that you're looking at in terms of the gangs and the the urban um, spatial kind of struggles over, you know, who goes where and what things mean is a kind of, again, a really good example of yeah. struggle within a particular spatial field in that instance. And, the, and the, um, the way that people are kind of trying to make the world in their own image through those struggles. So yeah. That's a, a really good, kind of interesting way to think about it. Yeah, it's going to... Um, and I, I do think that that kind of theoretical um, tools that you're using there are going to be also scalable themselves and be workable for other studies. Yeah. Um, no, I think yeah, I think that's going to be great. Yeah. Okay, so um, that that section um, is uh, uh, Alistair t talking about specifically some of the ethnographic work that he's been doing. So we, we just want to conclude um, the today's lecture by touching upon other uh, another example of uh, what happens in public space when there's um, uh, resistance against you know dominant uh, political and economic discourses, I suppose, yeah. um, and when they're express, uh, expressed, I suppose, in larger scale rights. Um, so uh, there's been numerous examples of these over the past decades, I suppose, you know, particularly it's two prominent ones recently in London and in France. Uh, some would argue that maybe the Cronulla rights in Australia in 2005 were a similar example of a, uh, of a kind of reaction against uh, political culture at the time, or most, probably for political culture at the time in that kind of instance. So, um, yeah, what, what do you want to tell us about uh, the yeah, relations I mean, of the I way riots and public space and politics kind of commingle? Yeah, I mean, I guess we, we don't have loads of time on this, but um, I guess the riots are, I mean, they were absolutely devastating. They have, I remember it really clearly. It was the, uh, the day I moved to Hong Kong from Glasgow and switched on the news and all of a sudden you saw these mm -hmm. shaky images of looted streets and blazing buildings and yeah London was on fire uh, and I mean it, it was uh, London, uh, London has a history of these kinds of urban violent disorders uh, but this was a particularly kind of striking uh, example I mean it started off with the uh, police shooting of Mark Duggan and, uh, and that was a trigger for a, a, what started as a, 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 a range of protests and then quickly developed into a range of um, yeah. uh, kind of disorders and yeah. uh, looting and riots across London and then across uh, different English cities. Um, 
So I mean, you can certainly contextualise this in the way that I uh, sketched earlier, yeah. using the work of Guy Standing and Luke Lacan about mm -hmm. uh, precarity, about anger, alienation, and anime, about urban outcasts, uh, and uh, the whatever it is that triggers and kind of then opened up this fissure in the social fabric. It, it demonstrated a kind of um, howl in the dark for yeah. many very excluded people in the city. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with it, um, there's a couple of videos there that you can kind of check out to uh, see what we're talking about here. And, um, it'll kind of illustrate it somewhat. Yeah. So if you haven't um, not familiar with that, please have a look at that now, and then I'll come back and continue on with the lecture. Yeah. And there's a oh, slide. Oh. There's a slide a little bit later also on yeah. a, a Guardian LSE collaboration called Reading the Riots yeah. uh, that also uh, kind of uh, collates together a range of different information sources yep. about the riots. I should have also mentioned earlier on when uh, Alistair was talking about Glasgow, there's a YouTube video there about a, with a small documentary on gangs in Glasgow, so yeah. uh, please check that out as well. Okay. Yeah, so the uh, I guess um, one thing that I wanted to mention here is the, um, the way, in the same way that I would say that you have to understand gangs uh, within an urban geneal genealogical history to understand their kind of unique waxing and waning and uh, conversions and divergence over time. Similarly, you have to locate riots in a historical perspective. Um, as Tim Newburn's work has shown, there have been a recurrent feature of urban life in England. Uh, and the riots of the 1980s show distinct parallels with the more recent riots in mm -hmm. the economic downturn, ethnic tensions and racialized conflicts, etc. There are lots of different ways that riots have been conceptualized uh, over time. Uh, one of the more prominent of these is Waddington's flashpoint model uh, that's, uh, that's summarized on the slide here. It sets out basically uh, a, a number of kind of factors that um, need to be present, I suppose, for, that are likely to, to produce the ingredients for a riot to happen. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, maybe we can just skip on to the riots in the contemporary perspective. Yes, with the uh, when one argument about uh, I mean that all these contextual factors can be present, but a riot doesn't occur. There, there is mm -hmm. something kind of uncertain or unpredictable about yep. when these uh, things emerge, but they do open up a kind of deep fissure in the social fabric and allow you people to show their kind of deepest and darkest desires, fears, yep. anxieties. Kind of uh, civilization is a thin veneer kind of... Absolutely, aspect, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the ways that the recent London riots have been read in that breath is the kind of triumph of consumerism. Uh, so they were taught, they were called the shopping riots. Yeah, they would call them the first ag consumer riots. Yeah, the ag uh, aggressive shopping. Uh, <laughs> and there was, I mean, there was all kinds of stories yeah. around people uh, I'm selling goods and then using the money to go and spend in the same stores after they reopened. Uh, right. So I mean, we, we, I guess we don't have time to go into that <laughs> aspect of it today. But, but so there were there were certainly some of the historical factors about uh, economic marginality, about um, racial discrimination amongst the police, mm -hmm. uh, about deeply entrenched um, uh, poverty. Uh, but there's also new things, and this cons consumerist undertow is certainly new. But also the speeds and malleability, uh, uh, they were uh, they were uh, uh, called the BBM or BlackBerry messaging riots mm. because there's a kind of encrypted text messaging software that enabled people to yep. quickly share information about. Yeah, uh, which resonates strongly with some of the stuff that was going on in Egypt earlier. That was kind of they were, they were using Twitter and stuff like that to. To organise, yeah, and, and enabled by yeah. by new media, yeah. So I mean, there there was a, a a paper published not long after the riots by James Treadwell and colleagues who did kind of um, immediate ethnographic observations and interviews uh, in three cities, and then laterally followed up with interviews uh, with rioters, and they found this theme of kind of aggressive consumerism, the uh, Zizek's idea of violent consumerism. Uh, Born out in those interviews, uh, amongst the absence of unifying politics, embedded unemployment, mm -hmm. a deep sense of inertia, uh, and yeah, the Treadwell quote there I think um, summarizes their argument for those yeah. involved: the limits of their desires extending no further than accumulation of consumer culture's symbolic objects. So I mean, 
but I mean, we've not got time to go into it here, but uh, I find the contrast with the Hong Kong umbrella movement really fascinating here. Uh, because in some senses there was a similar kind of break in the social order created by a critical mass of bodies on the street. Uh, and in, a same, in the same way they could have acted out their deepest, darkest desires. But yet there was no uh, looting, there was no smashing of uh, street windows, there was no fires, uh, there was order. There was civic obedience, there was recycling campaigns, there was tutorial centres, mm -hmm. there was the planting of... Uh, uh, plants in the holes in the concrete. Yeah. Uh, there was a fully sort of functional social order that just kind of emerged spontaneously and was based in uh, a major intersection. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, for me, this demonstrates uh, the the need to look locally and historically at the roots of instances of youth crime, mm -hmm. youth disorder, and youth politics that they can be talked about of a breath. Uh, uh, in a global context, they have to be firmly situated and located within a time and place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, maybe just to round this out, then, the, uh, um, on one hand, you have a kind of, I've been trying to introduce a sort of sociological analysis uh, of some of the antecedents and seeds of the riots. But um, as we learn from the deviance and labeling theorists, it's also important to look at social and societal reaction to them. Uh, and the gang has become a symbol for uh, um, UK politicians, uh, a symbol of blame. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the aftermath of the riots, the UK Prime Minister uh, stood up and said that at the heart of all the violence sits the issue of street gangs. Uh, the blame for the riots was laid squarely at the door of, the, uh, of the, this kind of elusive image of the global gang, despite the fact that later research demonstrated that that was not the case yeah. and the, the best research they could come up with uh, did not um, sustain that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, I guess to uh, conclude this section, uh, the, the 2011 riots can be read in a few different ways. Uh, one, in one sense, in, uh, through the lens of precarity and urban outcasts mm -hmm. and through the anger, anime and alienation experienced but also through a kind of genealogic, genealogical history, so understanding the role of urban history in development uh, in developing it. Um, but thirdly, the importance of understanding the role of the police and the criminal justice uh, practitioners in responding yeah. to and defining those events. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. I just noticed on the slide, one of the slides, uh, fetishized extreme experience. Um, Look, I don't. Uh, people are probably going to judge me after I say this, but looting looks like a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and it actually reminds me of the research about binge drinking and alcohol. So it, it's always research from the point of view of that it's a problem. Is it? You know, one of the things that kind of disappear from those kind of uh, analyses of these social problems is the actual affective enjoyment, the yeah. enjoyment of doing you know, rebellious, resistive things. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 I think, it, like, and I'm not, not saying this is what the research here is, but a, a lot of sociological research, I think, actually treats things as a problem straight away when I think sometimes we actually shouldn't be. We should be actually maybe thinking more about how these are actually human expressions of, um, you know, of just... Uh, Enjoyment and and you know yeah, well, and, and the our, our, it, like and you know our sensuous kind of engagement with the world is often done through these things that as as we've discussed are labelled deviant but maybe we actually want to do these kind of things more as humans and we're repressed. And I mean that's the, one of the fundamental tensions like between uh, youth culture and efforts mm -hmm. to control and regulate it. Right. Yep. So I, mean, I mentioned earlier the idea of doing nothing, of absolute yep. boredom and looking for excitement and violence yep. being um, part of that. And yep. cultural criminologists uh, absolutely take the line that you yep. just um, mentioned there, Steve, about uh, uh, Mike Presley's book, Cultural Criminology and the Carnival of Crime, particularly yep. talks about Halloween and fire as being a kind of carnivalist yep. activity that sort yep. of draws people in. It's a temporary break from the social order that's kind yep. of yearned for in, a, in our kind of screwed down tight 
button down world like yeah. these kinds of instances are yearned for um, mm. and I think you know, in a place like Australia where we're getting more and more and more regulations, right? So even people that are behaving really kind of just in the day-to-day -day life, there's more restrictions on, you know, everything, you know, from bike helmets to, you know, there's most of Newcastle's on alcohol-free zone. Even, you know, two people can't walk down the street and have a chat while they have a beer. Like, which, when Europeans come here, they find absolutely abhorrent. They can't understand why that's the case. My guess, and this is a total speculation, by the way, is that the more regulations that people face and the less freedom they think they have, the more likely um, reactions, not necessarily rights, but like, you know, strong resistive actions are likely to kind of pop up everywhere. Yeah. And people are going to then view them as coming from nowhere, if you know what I mean. How yeah. did this happen? But I think they, are, to me, seem to be very real reactions to... Um, yeah, rules and regulations and policy and all that kind of stuff. That yeah, and that's not that's not necessarily to condone or encourage rioting. Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. But but, I, but, yeah, but, yeah. but, but absolutely, it's to yeah. kind of locate and situate and understand. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Okay, so okay, we're gonna have to leave it there. I'm sorry if we went over time a little bit there. We probably packed a little bit too much into that, but I, I thought it was really important to um to cover this kind of aspect of youth studies that you know um. It wasn't kind of that prominent in the course, but uh, the reason that it, I think this was important for a few reasons. Firstly, that it was a different way of thinking about um, a different kind of, I suppose, subfield of youth studies, but also the way that Alistair's work uh, has drawn together uh, much of the uh, conceptual stuff that we've been looking at um, earlier in the course and the way that these things, you know, in, in a way bridge that gap between youth transitions and youth cultures that's kind of been the two um, areas of youth studies that more and more work recently is trying to bring together. So I think that um, is a really good example of that. Okay, thanks, Alistair. All right, thanks very yeah. much, Steve. Thank you.